Hi everybody, I'm Mike McCrory and this is Would You Make It? I have a client in Texas for whom I've already made a couple of chessboards and for the last year or so he's been wanting me to make him another one. He sent me this photo and asked if I could replicate it. I'm not sure what type of wood was used in that one but it kind of looks like mahogany and some kind of burl. And I'm pretty sure those are grooves between each of the squares. We agreed to take this design to the next level. Instead of cutting grooves between the squares, I'm going to use ebony dividers, and we're going to add a purple heart border around the playing field. For the squares, I'm going to use coco bolo and maple burl, and both of those woods are quite expensive, so this is going to be a high-end board. And I'll use quarter sawn white oak for the frame with a joint that is half mitered and the other half as a bridle joint. So let's get started. I'll start by preparing the maple burl. These are two really nice pieces of wood. $250 just for these two pieces. But they both have a lot of voids, especially on the other side. I'll mix up some total boat epoxy to fill the void so that we'll end up with a smooth playing field. I'll only need one of these pieces, but I'll prepare both of them now. I'll tape up the bottom and the sides so that the epoxy doesn't leak out. After the epoxy has cured, I'll run the pieces through the drum sander. There still remain a few voids, most likely caused by air gaps, that I'll need to fill a second time. Now I'll cut the coco bolo to the lengths for each of the rows. The squares are going to be two and a quarter inches, so I'll cut these pieces to be around 20 inches. That's because I'll need 18 inches for the squares, plus an eighth of an inch for each of the seven cuts to make the eight squares, and a little left over in case I don't get things lined up exactly. Then I'll joint the faces and one edge before running the pieces through the bandsaw.
I'll set the bandsaw to two and a half inches so that I'll have a little extra material. Each time I make a cut, I'll run the remaining piece through the jointer to straighten the edge, and then make the next cut. The coco bolo is thicker than the maple, so I'll use a piece of the maple as a gauge to set the fence so that I can cut off the excess coco bolo. I'd rather do that and have some leftover pieces that I can use for something else than run the coco bolo through the sander and have the excess turn into sawdust. It looks like I'll get some quarter inch slices that I can use for another chessboard one day. Next, I'll resaw the maple and coco bolo. I'm not cutting them in the middle because I'm not sure yet if the client wants one side of the board to be elevated from the frame, so I'm making one set of pieces extra thick just in case. I emailed him afterward and he let me know that he wants the playing surface to be flush with the frame on both sides. Next, I'll take some pieces of ebony and prepare them to be the dividers. I never throw out anything, so these are leftover pieces of ebony from another project that I had tucked away. I just need to sand them all to the same thickness. They ended up to be around 3 30 seconds of an inch thick. And then I'll sand all the pieces of coco bolo and maple burl to remove the saw marks and get them to a consistent thickness on each side of the board. Now I'll cut all of the strips of wood to be two and a quarter inches wide. That'll leave me with a whole bunch of fancy stir sticks that I can use for epoxy and other things. Now it's time to do the first glue up with the coco bolo, maple burl, and the ebony dividers. Thank you. 
I have this sitting on my clamping jig and I'll clamp a piece of plywood on top to help keep everything as flat as possible. I like these 24 inch Pony Jorgensen clamps because they're very light and easy to handle for a glue up like this that doesn't require a lot of clamping force. Next, I'll trim the remaining ebony strips to be thinner because the squares on the other side are thinner than the top side of the board. I'll cut them to a rough length and then everything is ready for the next glue up. After the glue has cured, I can sand the two boards. I used my crosscut sled to trim the end of each board. Then I can run each board along my fence that is two and a quarter inches away from the blade. This gives me the opportunity to cut the squares for both sides of the board so that the dimensions are the same on the top and bottom of the board. For this next glue up, I need to apply clamping force on all four sides of the board, so I need to trim the ebony to be the exact length of the playing field. I use one of the strips to set up my miter gauge so that I have the correct distance from the blade. Next I'll cut the plywood substrate. This is half inch plywood and it's one inch larger than the playing field to give a half inch overhang around the perimeter. Now it's ready for the next glue up. After the glue has cured, 
I'll sand this top surface and then proceed to gluing up the other side. I'll sand the other side and then trim the edges on the table saw so that the edges of the playing field are aligned on the top and bottom sides. This is important so that the frame will fit properly. I'm making the frame out of quarter sawn white oak. This is a piece left over from a bathroom door that I've made for my daughter's house. I still need to get those bathroom renovation videos out. Next I'll cut the purple heart border for the frame. I'm using a leftover piece from a live edge purple heart bar that I made a year ago. I need to get that video out too. I'm cutting a rabbit along one edge of the frame for the purple heart border. I had the fence a little too far from the blade, so I'll need to come back and make another cut to remove all of the material. I'll clamp these together and they'll most likely be stuck due to some glue squeeze out, but that's nothing that a whack from a hammer can't solve. Now that the glue has cured, I'll trim off the excess and then I'll cut a groove in each frame piece to fit around the plywood.
I'll make multiple cuts to sneak up on the fit. Now, this is where things start to get difficult. I spent countless nights tossing and turning in bed worrying about this joint because there's a lot that can go wrong. It just needs careful planning and execution. I'll start by marking the ends of each of the boards and then cutting them to length. The reason this joint is difficult is because the client requested a bridal joint, but it cannot be a pure bridal joint because of the purple heart border that would run all the way through to the other side, and also because of the groove that is cut out for the plywood that would become exposed. So I need to start off with a miter joint and then transition to a bridal joint. That one long cutoff will be perfect for a test cut later. Next, I need to mark the starting position and direction of the miter. Then I'll use a 3 quarter inch spacer to mark the location of where the bridle joint begins. Then I'll mark the waist portions to make sure I'm cutting on the right side of each line. Here's where things can start to go wrong, but I'm just proceeding cautiously with the piece clamped to my miter gauge set at 45 degrees to make sure that it doesn't move. When cutting the other end, I need to rotate the miter gauge in the other direction. I'm glad that my bandsaw is large enough to handle this cut. The final cut is easy. It just needs the fence to be set in the correct position. Next, I'll use my tenoning jig to cut the bridle joint. I'll start by cutting the center to be approximately 3 eighths of an inch. I'll make sure that it's perfectly centered by flipping the piece around and cutting it again. When I cut the other two pieces, I had to move the fence so far away from the blade that the piece was going to collide with the base of the tenoning jig. So I had to raise the piece up with a piece of plywood if I had realized that from the beginning, I would have raised all of the pieces up with the plywood to make the cuts. Instead, I had to adjust the blade height for this next round of cuts, so that introduces potential error. Everything ended up fitting together really well.
now I'll glue the frame onto the board. These joints are pretty good, but not absolutely perfect. So I'll add a bit of glue and sawdust to deal with any potential gaps. After sanding, the joints look much better than I had expected. Then, with my crosscut sled, I'll trim off the extra length that passes through the bridle joint. Then I'll use a 16th inch roundover bit to ease all of the edges and then finish up with a bit of hand sanding. I rubbed on a coat of de-waxed shellac to help seal the wood, give it a nice color, and raise the grain. And then I sanded it with 320 grit sandpaper to remove the raised grain. I emailed the client and asked if he wanted me to add finger slots, to which she replied yes, so I used a half inch round nose router bit and a couple of stop blocks to add in finger slots on all four sides that are about the length of two squares, so about four and a half inches. Maybe a little bit longer if you include the ebony spacers. And then I'll finish up with four or five coats of pre-catalyzed lacquer.
So I got to ask, would you make it? <laughs>